Welcome to our last lecture in our current eight-week series of lectures on world religions. Today we're going to be talking about um, two very sort of different categories. We're going to discuss today animism, new age, secularism, and atheism. And I'll get into that in just a minute. Before I do, there's a couple of announcements I want to make. First, um, I am planning, as, we, as those of you who have attended before know, we're going to be doing these eight-week lectures on a recurring basis. So in January, my plan right now is in January we will have the next series. And I'm very open to people making requests or suggestions as to what those series should be. Some of the ideas that I've had is to do an eight-week series on world cultures. I've done a one-hour lecture on ancient cultures. But on world cultures, one on ancient civilizations, so we can spend a little more time with some of them. I've considered um, great individual people in history, and perhaps even focusing on lesser known great people in history, or great moments in history, the sort of days that change the world kind of thing. Um, if you have preference, ideas, suggestions, I am very open to that. You can come and see me after the lecture, and we'll be happy to talk about it. Also, in response to requests that have come to me, because several people have asked me about that, if you're not a member of our church, but you can see that we're still finishing our building, we're planning right now to have our building completed and have a grand opening celebration on Sunday, the 22nd of November. We'd love for all of you all to come. Uh, in fact, if you don't have a church home and you're interested in finding out what this is all about, we'd love for you to visit our church anytime. But on the 22nd of November, we're having the grand opening. I've had several people say to me, because we don't charge for these lectures, is there any way that uh, they could give to help us complete the building? And so in response to that request, I will say there is a basket right at the center of the back doors. If there is no pressure, I'm not, nobody's watching, these lectures are free of charge and you're welcome to come. But if you would like to make a gift, that basket is available. You can drop something in there or you can see me personally afterwards if you would care to do that. And again, if you don't have a church that you currently are attending or want to find out what church is all about, maybe you don't have any experience with that, we'd love to have you come and visit us sometime. Our services here are at 10 o'clock on, on Sunday mornings. So, the previous lectures we have done, last week, of course, we did Islam, which was the last of really the world religion lectures. Today, we're doing kind of a sweeping up, and as I said, we're going to be doing two ends of things. Uh, today, we're going to talk about animism, New Age, Secularism, and Atheism. And these are like bookends because atheism, for instance, is perhaps the oldest of religious uh, motivations or feelings. It is not actually considered a religion because it's not organized in any particular way, and it, actually, it has been an influence on a lot of others. But it is perhaps the oldest of religious motivations. We then have the New Age movement, which is very similar in some ways to animism, but it is, as the name suggests, very new, starting in the 70s primarily. We're going to talk about those. And then we're going to talk about secularism and atheism, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the new atheism, which has come out since uh, post 9-11, actually, so after 2001. And this is interesting, too, because while animism and New Age are sort of extreme versions of believing in spiritual beings, the secularism and atheism are the extreme versions of not believing in spiritual beings. So we're looking at sort of the extreme ends of any sort of political or uh, religious motivation. So we'll get into that today. This chart I, I keep putting up, it's a list of all of what today are considered world religions. It does include the non-religious, but I want to just you know, give you a, a, kind of a, a summary of where we came from. The question of what is religion, two of the definitions we looked at, Joseph Runzo in the Global Philosophy of Religion said genuine religion is fundamentally a search for meaning beyond materialism, meaning beyond the material world, that there is something supernatural. And then Edmund uh, Burnett Tyler in 1871 did a, a very famous anthropological book called Primitive Cultures, and he said religion is the belief in spiritual beings a belief that has existed in all known societies. Every culture, everywhere that we know of, has had some kind of religious belief. <laughs> the idea of the atheist and new atheist movement in terms of a, a, any sort of major movement is a brand new thing. It is, it is in our lifetimes, quite literally. And so we're going to talk about that, and it's interesting. Ed, uh, Edward Burnett Tyler, who I, I used this quote from him in our first lecture, we talked about generally religion. He is the one who coined the phrase animism, and he is the one that is considered the anthropologist in the late 1800s who really identified animism as a religious motivation that has influenced a lot of other religions. It is part of Shinto, it is part of um, a number of other major world religions, a sort of an underlying belief. 
We talked about different ways that people perceive God, and the box reflects what we're going to talk about today. Again, the two extremes, animism, the belief that all natural phenomena have, have souls, and it is at the source of, of most primitive religions and some modern world religions, and then atheism, the idea that there is nothing supernatural, there are no gods or God, so we're going to get into that, okay? As always, feel free if you have questions as we go along to ask me, so let's jump into this. Animism, first. Animism is a folk religion um, with a worldview that non-human entities, as well as humans, we include animals, plants, and inanimate objects, possess a spiritual essence. That there is a spirit of the trees, there is a spirit of the river, there is a spirit of the rocks, there is a spirit of the deer. And so as a folk religion, folk religion is defined, sometimes it's referred to as it's called simply popular belief. And uh, a folk religion are the views and practices of religion that exist outside any of the world religions and are indigenous, meaning it's their religious beliefs that, folk religion are religious beliefs that start locally, they're not brought in from outside, and they are not part of the larger context, in, as we're talking about them, of world religions, and they are independent, and they will vary from one place to the other. Animism is one of the most common of the expressions of these folk religions, or sometimes referred to as primitive religions. They begin indigenously, locally, they're very ancient, and they, all, they vary widely. It has been suggested that animism may be the, the, it's been called the seed of religion, because it is one of the oldest religious motivations, and it is the foundation, as I said already, of some of the world religions that exist today. In particular, we can identify that animism does not see a separation between the spiritual and the physical world. Um, Rene Descartes in, had a great philosopher, mathematician, etc. He, um, he originally proposed what's called the Cartesian duality, and that has been accepted by Western civilizations ever since. Rene Descartes said, there is mind and there is body, and they're different. Well, animism does not see that separation. They don't accept the Cartesian uh, duality. They see that the physical and spiritual world are intertwined. That everything physical has a spiritual aspect. And that includes even the things that are not material, like uh, thunder and wind and shadows. All of them are perceived as having some sort of spirit. Now, one aspect of, of it, and you all are familiar with that. Do you remember the Learner and Lowe song? And people think it was a folk song, but it actually was a show tune. It was from Paint Your Wagon. Um, they call the wind Mariah. You remember that? Now, west they have a, a name for things, for rain and wind and fire. The rain is Tess, the fire is Joe, and they call the wind Mariah. That is a perfect example of an animistic view of things. That the natural phenomena in the world, not only physical things, but any sort of natural phenomena has a spirit and frequently a name and can be identified that way. Now, um, another name for this, by the way, uh, Auguste Comte, the, the, French, uh, the French scholar, called this fetishism. Fetishism has come to mean something else most recently, but if you read any scholarly works about fetishism in terms of the old definition, it will mean the same thing as animism. Now, there's a, there are several specific versions of that. One of them that you might be familiar with as well is called totemism. Totemism is the belief that um, each human being has a spiritual connection or a kinship to some other being, and that being maybe an animal or a plant, um, and they refer to that as a totem or a spirit being. In the, the, the northwest of the United States, including up in Alaska, Totem poles are reflections of the idea that there are spirits in killer whales or seals or eagles or whatever. Um, some of you may have read many years ago a best-selling novel called The Clan of the Cave Bear. In ancient times, it was very common, and in some places still in more primitive cultures today, uh, primitive not being, I'm not using that as a derogatory word, it's just less sophisticated by Western standards, uh, they will still have a sense in which they are even descended the people of the tribe are descended from a particular kind of animal, a cave bear or a killer whale or something else. Those then get reflected as a totemic or a totem that is, in some cases, actually not only revered but almost worshipped. And they see themselves as connected with that being. 
And so they look to that being, uh, that spirit being connected to that animal or thing as being uh, their, the source of their protection and of their energy. All right? So totemism is one of the aspects, it's one version of animism. An example would be, for instance, that the Australian Aborigines are very animistic. They believe that you know, there are spirits in the various things. Uluru, which, uh, which we know as Ayers Rock, is, is, a, is considered a holy place. And they believe that there, it, there is a great spirit that manifests itself at Uluru. This, you know, that's the plateau out in the middle of the outback kind of thing. Um, so they're very animistic. Whereas, as I say, the Alaskan Native Americans Many of them are totemic. They follow totems. They believe that they are their tribe is linked to a particular kind of spirit being that's represented by an animal or a natural phenomenon. A third aspect of animism that's quite frequent is shamanism. Shamanism is the way in which people try to get in touch with or communicate with, or in some cases, um, try to communicate in order to prevent from being hurt by the various spirits that exist in the world. Shamanism uses a practitioner, a spiritual guide or practitioner, in an effort to try to communicate with these spirits, the spirits of the natural phenomena, etc. So it is like a practice. And these shamans are, are, are like primitive priests. Frequently they will be seen as going into uh, trances, in order to, and in those trances they're able to communicate either with benevolent or malevolent spirits, either to encourage their help or to ask them not to hurt. One of, the, one of the aspects of animism is that it quite often is concerned with not being harmed by these spirits. And so shamanism, and there, I'm going to give you a couple of pictures here in a second, some of the spirit houses that you'll see in Southeast Asia are efforts to try to satisfy the demands or expectations of the spirits so those spirits will not wreak havoc or do damage to human beings. Um, some pictures. This is a photograph of a Nigerian woman uh, possessed by the spirit of Oya. Oya is the spirit of the water buffalo. And so she is she's taking a shamanistic role. She is seen to be possessed and in communication with the spirit of Oya in order to be able to, to communicate with, uh, learn from, etc. Um, this image uh, is a very sort of sugary version of the Native American idea that there is the see it there. The spirit of the wolf is a very powerful spirit to Native Americans, as is the spirit of the buffalo, for instance. Um, and then above that, they see the, the spirit of the great spirit. Native American religions, uh, whenever you believe that the world, the things in the world are God, that's called pantheism. I've mentioned that before. That was on our list of the ways people view God. In other words, some, some religions, even world religions, Far Eastern religions, believe that the trees and the mountains and the rivers and that chair and you and me, we all together make up God. That's pantheism. For if you believe that all of those things plus something more is God, that's panentheism. Native American religions, in North American at least, are panentheistic because they believe there is the spirit of the mountain and the spirit of the wolf, etc. But then they believe there is a great spirit that is, is above that, is even more added on to that. That is panentheism. Everything is part of the divine, but there is something more than that that is not manifest in the physical world, right? Um, many of the animistic religions practice ancestor worship. This is why we would say that Shinto, the Japanese uh, state religion, which is a world religion, why it is an animistic religion to the extent that they participate in ancestor worship. Um, and then these two images um, are examples of spirit houses, which are predominant especially in Southeast Asia. If you go to Burma or Cambodia, Laos or Thailand, it is very common. In fact, in some areas, it's predominant. Every house that you go to or every business that you visit, at some corner of the lot, there will be a pillar or a dais, a raised area that will have this small house on it. They're quite often, as you can see, they can be quite beautiful. These are spirit houses, and often you will see inside these spirit houses an offering of fruit or beverage or something of that sort. Um, and so. The idea is that people say, oh, they're so pretty. Well, spirit houses in Southeast Asia are intended to provide a, spirit, a place for the spirits to live that they can be satisfied so they will not hurt or bother the people who live in the house or, or running the business. So this is quite common, but it's an effort to propitiate the spirits so that they will not, you know, will not get involved or do damage. Now, animism, this, this belief in spirits and all things, as I say, is kind of a, 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 an 
underlying religious motivation. It's an earlier, the earliest attempt to try to explain the phenomena in the world. In fact, if you all, I didn't get into that so much in this class, but if you attended my previous set of lectures when I talked about ancient religions, I said there are two basic ways of understanding how religions start. The most primitive, the most ancient of them are efforts by people to explain natural phenomena. What causes this loud noise of the thunder? Back in the time when thunder was by far the loudest thing anybody would ever hear, it was scary. What causes floods? What causes any of these things? So religion began in ancient times often in order to try to explain the natural phenomena, and animism is a perfect example of that. The other kind of religious motivation is called revelation, and that's especially true in I mean, Revelation was an aspect of Buddhism because Buddha was seen as the great teacher who gave that guidance, but it's most especially prevalent in the monotheistic religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all believe that God, the one God, revealed himself. It's not just that they looked around and saw these things and had to come up with some way to explain them, but rather that God reveals himself. So those two ways of understanding, an attempt to explain natural phenomena, and perhaps even to control them a little bit, uh, to protect yourself, that's the spirit house's idea, versus having had the truth revealed to you by a divine being. And animism is sort of the, the, the most basic, the most ancient, the most primitive version of the first one. Looking at the natural phenomena and trying to figure out how to satisfy the spirits that are represented, how to explain natural phenomena, etc. Okay, does that make sense? So this is animism. Some call it the seed of religion because it is one of the most ancient of religious motivations. It is not itself a religion because it is too diverse for that, it is too widespread, there's no consistent doctrine or theology or holy books or anything of that sort. And so it's simply a religious motivation, an appeal to the spiritual. Let's go to the second one, if you don't have any questions about that one, which is actually related, but very new, like 1970s new, and that is the New Age Movement, as it's called. In the 1970s, in Great Britain first, and some other parts of, of Western Europe, but especially Great Britain, and then, then in the 80s and 90s it moved to the United States, there was this movement of spiritual and religious beliefs that all were pretty much, see the thing about the New Age movement is it's not new. In fact, it was a rediscovery or a refocus on some very old ideas, older, very esoteric, very mysterious, sort of mystery ideas in religion. And it includes parts of astrology, occultism, channeling, spiritualism, some pieces of Hinduism, for instance, Hare Krishna, the, the Krishna consciousness really came in a big way out of that. Um, the Gnosticism, the ancient Greek um, Gnosis, or the, the cults that were based upon secret knowledge. Uh, Theosophy, the Theosophical Society founded by Helen Blavatsky and others that, that sort of mixed Western religion with occultism. Wicca, which is modern witchcraft, New Paganism, which is a, a, an effort to recover some of the old pagan ideas, including worshiping some of the old Norse gods and Germanic gods and things of that sort, New Thought, the UFO, the UFO cults of the 1950s, the extreme examples of that more recent uh, continuation would be like the Heaven's Gate, you know, the group in California that committed suicide because they thought the mothership had arrived and they were going to go up and meet them. That's an example of a UFO cult. The counterculture movement, which basically was saying that the current um, secular humanism, Christianity hasn't worked in the West, secular humanism hasn't worked, we need to have a countercultural movement. And then the human potential movement, that we can be whatever we, you know, that we can be greater than we are, and all progress is up to us. Now, the thing about the New Age movement is, in addition to the fact that it's not new, these are very old ideas, very old religious motivations, is it's almost impossible to define because it's so many different things. There is no one creed, no one text, no central organization. There are no priests, there is no central dogma, there's no geographical center for it. In most cases, this um, develops around metaphysical bookstores. In fact, it is very difficult in the US or in Europe, Western Europe especially, in any major city not to find one or more metaphysical bookstores. I know exactly where the one is in Seattle, okay? Um, and uh, the biggest one, at least. And so, Frequently it's the bookstores, or what they sometimes call education centers. But it's not organized. There is no organization part of this. John Naisbitt, who is a futurist, and he's author of a book you I'm sure have seen called Megatrends. It came out in the 80s, it's been revised since then. And he, a uh, great influencer on the modern futurist idea, what's going to happen in the future. 
Well, he says this. He said, in turbulent times, in times of great change, people head for the two extremes, fundamentalism and personal spiritual experience. So they go in one of those two directions, fundamentalism or very personalized spiritual experience. He continues, with no membership list or even a coherent philosophy or dogma, it is difficult to define or measure the unorganized New Age movement. But in every major U.S. and European city, thousands who seek insight and personal growth cluster around a metaphysical bookstore, a spiritual teacher, or an education center. Sometimes this relates to spiritual healing practices, Reiki, um, which it, it came out of this, Yo the, the expanse, expansion of yoga in the United States. And I'm not saying that all yoga is New Age. But the great expansion of that, the development of yoga studios, and that as a meditation form, and not just an exercise form, um, really is part came out of the of the New Age movement. In fact, the New Age movement, while it is not a religion, the influence is so pervasive, especially in the United States, that research has shown, shown that a great many Americans who will hold a kind of world religion belief, who would say they are Christian, Catholic, Christian, Protestant, Christian, whatever, or Buddhists or something else, will also hold some of the kind of beliefs that are typical in the New Age movement, which is one of the reasons that the New Age movement has been such a target of opposition from the Catholic Church and from various even the Protestant evangelicals and others, because they see it as a real a dangerous kind of influence. Related to that, studies have shown that 8% of all Americans believe in astrology as, some, as a means of foretelling the future. That's a very, the growth of that has been a very new age thing, that's 8%. Realizing that just over 90% of all Americans would say they're Christians. Well, there, there's an overlap there. It's not like the 8% that believe in astrology are the 8% that don't claim to be Christians. There is an overlap. 7% of, Christ, of uh, um, Americans believe that crystals are a source of healing or energizing power even though there have been very specific, rigorous scientific studies that show there is no healing or spiritual power in crystals. 9% of Americans believe that tarot cards are a reliable basis for life decisions. How many of you have, is it, there anybody here who has never seen a spiritual reader or a tarot card site somewhere in the city? You've never seen one? Oh, I No, okay, yeah, exactly, I've called what? <laughs> you see them everywhere. About one in four Americans, um, believe in a non-traditional concept of nature and the, the nature of God within that. For instance, 11% uh, of that 25% believe that God is, and I quote, a state of higher consciousness that a person may reach. That's their definition of God, higher consciousness. 8% believe that God is, and I quote, the total realization of personal human potential. Remember the human potential movement as part of this? And 3% believe that each person is God or is a God. Find the God that is in you. Friends, that is not part of any world religion, you know, it's certainly not part of Christianity, the dominant religion in the United States, which is, which is what this is referring to. So you get this idea that while the New Age movement is not a religion, it has been, it has sort of seeped into the corners of Western culture in a very significant way. And again, there are parts of it that are actually contradictory to other parts of it and still fall under this movement. The reason it's called the New Age movement, by the way, is that there is a theory that the age of Aquarius, which nobody really knows when that's going to be. The idea is that there's a, that one aspect of the, the I won't get into the details, there's a 26,000 year cycle of the movement of the Earth's axis. And divided by 12 zodiac signs, that means that each one of those is 2,160 years. Then. And so the age of Pisces, which is what we've been in, 2,160 years. The next one after Pisces is Aquarius. The belief of New Age people is that, and, and there's a question about when, when we got into this, or have we yet. Some people say it happened in 1911, some people say it's going to happen in the year 3,128, uh, in all different ideas. But the age of Aquarius, you guys know, 50 minutes. That's the song. You know, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Well, the idea is that's where New Age comes from. That when the age of Aquarius begins, whenever that's going to be, and, no, and they can't agree, that it is going to be the time of enlightenment and the growth of human potential and we're going to exceed, you know, anything that we thought was possible, etc. That's where that whole movement comes from. But along the way, there's a huge emphasis on astrology and channeling, sort of fringe parts of Hinduism, as I said, Gnosticism, spiritualism, Taoism comes into this, um, and neo-pagan traditions and all kinds of other stuff. So it is really a mix of all of this stuff. 
um, followers of Emmanuel Swedenborg, Swedenborgianism, the Theosophical Society, and Adam Blavatsky, and all of that. Um, so, quite the mixed bag. And the odds are that some of you maintain some of those ideas. Joanne? Where does Scientology fit in anything? Oh, my goodness. Oh, Scientology doesn't fit in anything anywhere. Um, <laughs> yes. Other than Hollywood, apparently. Uh, it's Hollywood. Scientology is a... Is a Boy, I can get into this. It's certainly not a world religion. It's not really part of New Age. Um, while the Scientologists disagree with this, there were a lot of witnesses that uh, back before the Scientology religion was started, L. Ron Hubbard founded it. He was a novelist. And he was speaking at a writer's conference once. And again, they deny this, but a lot of people heard him say this. And somebody asked L. Ron Hubbard, well, how can you make money as a writer? And L. Ron Hubbard said, you can't make money as a writer. If you want to make money, start a religion. And a few years after that, Scientology came along. All right, Scientology is is it's twenty pounds of crazy in a ten pound bag. I'm sorry, but there's very little that you can say positive about it. So, if anybody has any questions or you want to arm wrestle me over that, come and see me afterwards. But it's it's a strange one. Okay, question or comment? Okay. Um, so I could go on about the New Age movement, but the main thing you need to understand is that it is a hodgepodge of a lot of ancient kind of ideas brought up recently and very superficial, you know, and very few of them taken very seriously. It is some pantheism, God is everything, God is in you, everything is God, God is everything. There is panentheism, everything is God, and then some um, reincarnation is in there, the Hindu belief in karma is part of it, uh, the belief in auras, that we all have an aura and energy uh, signature that can be read and, and manipulated in some ways, personal transformation, um, the universality of religion, that all religions, and Baha'i is a reflection of this, although it came before the New Age movement, that all religions are but fingers of the hands of God. I didn't get into Baha'ism. Baha'ism was, came out of Islam. They believed that a new prophet came and brought a new revelation, and so it is a version, um, and the Islamic people, uh, Muslims, believe it's a terrible heresy. But if you ever want to see beautiful buildings and beautiful grounds, go to one of the Baha'i centers. The one in Haifa is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen uh, in Israel. But Baha'i is one of, those, one of those things that says all religions are but fingers of the hand of God. Well, that's a very New Age kind of idea, that all religions are equally right, whatever is most meaningful to you. Other world religions, most of them, a few of them would be okay with that, most of them would say, that's kind of silly. You can't believe everything is true. All right, that's a philosophical point. Everything can't be equally true if they say contradictory things. That's basic laws of logic. I think I mentioned that when we started. So, that's New Age. And you'll, you see, you'll see flavors of that everywhere. It's one of the reasons I mentioned it. Right? Because it does bring up a lot of the more ancient religious ideas. Grace? I understood, at least originally, that the local open circle uh, is partly New Age. Well, it's possible. She said that the, the local open circle is partly New Age. Uh, New Age is not clearly defined. I mean, it, it could be one week and not be the next in any any kind of, of meeting. It depends upon, you know, are they, what are they talking about? So, that, I, I can't say, I've never been there, but it depends upon what they're de dealing with in any specific time. It's not like they've, you know, they've accepted a creed, because they're not discipline. It's not like they say, um, yeah, we, we accept those beliefs of the New Age movement, because that's not written down anymore. Yes? I've been, and it's mostly educational. Okay. So, and, and people, different people have different perceptions of that, I'm sure. So. All right, I now want to go to the other end of the, of the spectrum. Instead of talking about the belief in spirit world, and again, animism, ultimate belief in the spirit world, New Age, much of it, uh, you know, New Age, for instance, the channeling part of that, they believe in spiritual beings, angels and the ascended masters, you get into that, and the people who channel uh, the ascended masters. So they're very much the idea in the, both of those areas of there being spiritual beings. If you go to the other end of the spectrum and sort of starting with the next topic, which is secularism. Secularism is the principle of the separation of government from religion. We all know separation of church and state. Well, for in the United States, we have a separation of church and state. The Constitution says that the government will not do anything to either deny or promote freedom of religion is basically what the Constitution says. 
the articulation of separation of church and state actually came under Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson is one who talked about that. that. Those words are not in the Constitution. But the principle that the government should not tell people how to worship, nor should they prevent people from worshiping, as long as they're not hurting somebody else, is very much basic to the American idea. But secularism didn't really begin with us. It began in the 19th in the U.S. It began in a big way in Europe as a counter-reaction against Catholicism. Now, and most specifically, as the Catholic Church began to lose its influence, now, remember, the idea of separation of church and state is a relative, relatively new idea. When the United States said this in, the, in you know, 1776, it was very rare. In almost every case prior to that, the, the dominant church, particularly the Catholic Church in Europe, was very involved, either as in controlling or as a, a power, you know, as a counter authority to the rulers. In fact, the history of Western Europe from, from 1000 on, I can even say earlier, um, 1080 on, could be almost defined in terms of, was the Pope more powerful than the, than the kings, or were the kings more powerful than the Pope, and where's the Holy Roman Emperor and all that? I mean, that, did, that really drove much of the historical events. So that issue of the influence of the church, especially the Catholic Church, was a huge deal. Um, you might even say that the French Revolution was significantly motivated as a rebellion against the influence of the church on the political life and secular life of the people. So, as we say here, from the end of the 19th century, especially the 1800s, secularism in Europe meant freedom of public institutions, especially schools, primary schools, government-sponsored schools from the influence of the Catholic Church. So it, secularism, in, a, in the biggest way, even though the United States had sort of declared it prior to the 19th century, the biggest emphasis of secularism was against the influence of the Catholic Church in schools and in public institutions. The idea was that freedom of thought and freedom of religion were among the highest values. You know, the, the French Revolution, um, equality, liberty, and brotherhood. Well, liberty to them, to a great extent, and liberty from religious influence. There was a huge growth in um, the move in atheism in the French Revolution. Um, a massive emphasis on atheism, of not accepting God, of being self-determining as individual people. All right. So uh, they didn't start there. There was a move towards secularism as far back as the Greek philosophers, uh, Epicurus and Marcus Aurelius. Both wrote about the need for people, for political institutions especially, not to be influenced by religious beliefs. And of course, in their day, that meant the Greek pantheon of the, of the gods, the polytheism of ancient Greek. Um, uh, Dennis Diderot, Voltaire, Baruch Spinoza, James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson in, uh, in the United States, all of them identified themselves as free thinkers and as, therefore, secularists, that we should separate. As I say, it was Thomas Jefferson that really coined the word separation of church and state. Those words are not in the Constitution in the U.S. But the French, more than anything else, have emphasized this. In fact, they, they talk about laicism. We talk about lay people, people who aren't ordained, right? Well, laicism is based upon a French word, laïcité, which means the absence of religious involvement. And so there was a huge emphasis that came out of that. And, and interestingly enough, in Europe, France especially, but in Europe, there was a, a, a real focus on state secularism and personal secularism. That's why the, the, you know, the French Revolution was a, almost a grassroots kind of thing that grew up and then turned very solid, by the way. But the, in the United States, while there is a state secularism, separation of church and state, the United States has never experienced sort of a, 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 a local grassroots kind of secularism. There has almost always been a sense in which personal people, individual people, do allow religious ideals and their church to influence them. Let's face it, you know, it's going to be a long, long time before any American president will ever get elected unless he's very clear on what his religious values are. Even though we have, technically, we have a separation of church and state because on a private level, and we evaluate our candidates for office based upon how they represent themselves as private individuals, that becomes an issue. It was astonishing to many people when John F. Kennedy got elected president because he was the first Catholic ever to become president of the United States. That was a bigger hurdle to overcome than electing our first black president. And a lot of people don't remember that, but it was. So that's a very big deal. Related to secularism, and secularism was kind of foundational, it was early. From it had come a lot of, of other kinds of ideas, some actually before it, some after that. One of them is humanism. 
Humanism, most atheists or freethinkers today would identify themselves as humanists. That means they focus on humanity as being of prime importance, as opposed to a focus on God or deities or the supernatural things. Man is the measure of all things. Okay, uh, that's, a, that's an ancient Greek idea. One of the sophist teachers first said that. But humanism says the important thing, prime importance, is the focus on humanity, not on spiritual things or God. We then have naturalism. Naturalism is a belief that everything that is derives from natural material properties or causes, rather than from any supernatural or spiritual sources. So naturalism says the natural world, the material world, is all there is. There is no spiritual. So it's non-religious because remember, one of the definitions, frequently the definitions of religion is belief in spiritual beings. Naturalism says, no, if you can't taste it, touch it, see it, feel it, it can't be real. So it is anti-supernatural or spiritual. And then, scientism. Now, scientism does not mean scientific. Scientism is a philosophical position that says that the natural sciences alone are a legitimate method of human inquiry. That only science is a legitimate way to achieve any kind of understanding. That there are no other human faculties that can be applied that will give you any kind of understanding. Only science. Right? And scientism is quite dominant. Um, so, from secularism, we find humanism, the focus on human as the, as the main point, nothing supernatural. Naturalism, that everything is physical and material, there is no supernatural. And scientism, that science is the only way for us to develop any understanding about anything. There is no other means by which humans can proceed. Those have become quite common in the last hundred years or so, two hundred years or so at least. Eventually, those turn into atheism. Atheism, of course, is the rejection of a belief in the existence of deities, whether that be God or multiple gods or any kind of supernatural beings. An atheist, the word atheist is Greek, a theo. Theos means not God. An atheist does not believe in God in any way. Now that's contrasted with theism, which is a belief that there is a deity or deities. Theism is, doesn't mean Christianity. It can mean any belief that there is a, a divine being. Okay? So there's the difference there. Originally, the word atheist was entirely negative and pejorative in its use. The early Christians, for instance, were called by the Roman authorities, they were called atheists because they refused to worship the Roman pantheon of gods. And they refused to worship the emperor. Obviously, that didn't mean they didn't believe in a god. That's the reason they wouldn't worship the pantheon and the emperors, because they believed there was a god who had been represented in Jesus Christ. But they were called atheists as a pejorative, a negative term. The first time that we really see atheists being claimed by people for themselves, calling themselves atheists, is during the Age of Enlightenment, with a focus on rationalism, and most especially, again, during the French Revolution. The French Revolution was noted for a time of unprecedented atheism, where people took great pride in declaring that they had freed themselves from any belief in the divine or in God. Atheism was considered a badge of honor in the French Revolution. Now, the arguments for atheism vary widely. They can be philosophical uh, or social or historical. There can be arguments from a lack of empirical evidence. Bertrand Russell, famous British philosopher um, and, and scholar, a fascinating writer, by the way, he was a, a, a profound atheist, and he said, somebody asked him once, well, you know, Mr. Russell, if you ever appeared before God and discovered it really was true and you've been mistaken, what, what defense would you make? And Bertrand Russell said, lack of evidence, lack of evidence. Well, I personally don't think so, <laughs> which is why I do what I do. But um, a lot of people think there is a lack of empirical evidence. The problem of evil, how can there be, a, in the Christian sense, how can there be a God who's all-powerful and all-loving and still have evil in the world? Wouldn't he either want to or be able to get rid of it? Um, there's actually a whole branch of apologetic philosophy that tries to deal with that. It's called a theodicy, dealing with the, the nature of evil if God exists. Um, there are the argument from inconsistent revelations. If there is a God, then why do different people have very different ideas of who he is and what he is? Um, the rejection of concepts that cannot be falsified. Falsification is a weird way to say this. It means can't be tested. You would think they'd say they can't be proved, but in fact, in the scientific terms, uh, in philosophical terms, they refer to falsification. You can't be tested. You can't prove it one way or the other. You can't prove it's true. You can't prove it's false. 
Uh, arguments from non-belief. That some, if, if God were all-powerful, wouldn't he make everybody believe? Why is that? Well, there are answers. There are a lot of answers to those things, I need to tell you. And, um, in fact, I've got almost 300 hours of lectures online, and some of them address those very specific kinds of questions. I'm not going to get into that now, because I'm talking about uh, atheism. Now, some atheists accept other secular philosophies, like humanism or skepticism as a philosophical approach, or um, scientism, naturalism, but uh, atheism basically means they do not believe there is any divine beings of any kind. Now, how many atheists are there? If you read Christopher Dawkins or, uh, or I'm sorry, Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens or these guys, the new atheists I'm going to mention in a minute, they'll tell you that basically anybody with any sense is an atheist, whether they'll admit it or not. Okay. Well, there's no evidence for that. In fact, various studies have been done. Gallup International did a global study, and in 2012, there were 13% of the respondents, that were, they, they polled 64,000 people in many different countries. 13% said that they were either atheists or not religious. And one of the reasons it's very hard to get any numbers on this stuff is defining what is an atheist versus somebody who's non-religious. Atheist means, I believe there is no God. Non-religious says, I don't know. You know, but I, I'm not declaring anymore. Plus, you ask a Buddhist who technically would be an atheist, what their religious affiliate, because Buddhism does not maintain a belief in God. Right? You don't have to believe in God to be a good Buddhist. You ask a Buddhist, it, you know, check the box that tells what you believe. He'll check Buddhist. He won't check atheist, even though he may also be an atheist. Same thing is true with some Hindus. It's very difficult to count. But the interesting thing is the Gallup poll in 2012 identified 13% as being uh, convinced atheists are non-religious. And in 2015, the number had gone down to 11%. In fact, studies recently have shown that religious belief is on the rise globally. More people are beginning to declare themselves to be religious. Now, at the same time, in certain countries, in Britain, in the United States, the number of people who identify themselves as atheists has gone up slightly. In the U.S., it's gone up like 1% over the last, I think, 23 years. It's not gone up drastically, but it's only gone up about 1%. So there are people who are being much more outspoken about saying, I do not believe there is a God. But it's not nearly as overwhelming as we might be led to believe. Okay? And those who would wish to, believe, to, to convince us of that, the new atheists. New atheism is a late 20th, early 21st century, especially 21st century, social and political movement that is in favor of atheism and secularism. In fact, some of the, um, like Christopher Hitchens, who died in 2011, he insisted that atheism was not the right term. He insisted on being called an anti-theist. Because one of the things that differentiates the new atheist movement is that not just that they don't believe in God, but they are aggressive, even angry, about wanting to get rid of any belief in God, of deities. That especially is targeted at the monotheistic religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Because the, the primary leaders and writers of the New Atheist Movement are British and American, they especially target Christianity now. But it started out as a focus on Islam because it was motivated prim primarily by the attacks uh, on 9-11. Um, I'll get into that a little bit. But to give you an idea of the aggressive attitude that they have, this is a, this is a quote from an article. Religion should not simply be tolerated, but should be countered, criticized, and exposed by rational argument wherever its influence arises. They believe that faith of any kind is not only irrational and unjustified, but even is the source of evil. Right? They are very aggressive. They are very political in terms of trying to get laws passed that would prevent religion from having even as much influence as it does. Um, so they're anti-theistic. They're very aggressive, even angry about this. They're very political in terms of movements. Um, and probably the thing that stands out most about them is they, are, they have best-selling books. You know, this began in 2004 when Sam Harris, in response to, to the 2001 attacks in uh, New York and Washington, D.C., 9-11, he wrote a book called The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason. That was sort of the first major new atheist writing, and it became a bestseller. Um, since then, a number of books have been written by the other leaders, and I'm going to talk about them in a minute, and they've all been bestsellers. In fact, Tom Flynn, Tom Flynn is an author, he's a journalist, and he's the executive director of the Council for Secular Humanism. 
definitely not a religious person. He said this, New atheism is neither a movement nor is it new. And that, uh, but what is new is the publication of atheist materials by big name publishers, read by millions, and appearing on bestseller lists. These guys have gotten very rich writing these books, okay? And in the process have greatly opposed any kind of religious belief, especially monotheistic religious beliefs. How would you um, explain the popularity of those books? It's such a Christian, strongly Christian. Well, we have been more and more influenced. Uh, all of these guys, except Christopher Hitchens, are scientists. And so we have gotten in our culture to the point where we so elevate science, scientism, that science is the only real source of knowledge or understanding, that when somebody comes out who is a scientist, and some of these guys, um, I'm going to mention uh, Richard Dawkins and, Christopher, and uh, Daniel Dennett, Samuel Harris not so much, I mean he was only a grad student when he first wrote that first book, but um, they're scientists, and some of them scientists of significant note. Richard Dawkins' concept of the, his book, The Selfish Gene, in which he presented the idea that the, the gene is, is really the point at which we need to understand evolutionary progress, was quite revolutionary. And highly, highly, and the interesting thing is that Richard Dawkins to this day will say that he cannot, he said that uh, scientists, quality scientists who believe in God, he says, are just a bafflement to their fellows. He can't understand how somebody can be a great scientist. Francis Collins, who was the director of the Human Genome Movement, cons widely considered the most significant scientific pursuit ever in the history of humanity, is a committed Christian. Sir John, uh, Professor Sir John Polkinghorne, one of the most recognized physicists in Europe, he's Sir John Polkinghorne because his scientific achievements were so significant he was knighted for it. He left science in order to become a rector in, a, in an Anglican church. Um, you get people like that who are very committed believers who have the highest level. And Dawkins and the people like him, in fact, I saw an interview uh, uh, online between Christopher Hitchens, who's a journalist, he's not a scientist, but he's probably the most interesting character and the most interesting writer of the whole bunch. And Hitchens looked down in the front row while he was talking, and Francis, um, the, Francis Collins, the director of the Human Genome Project, is sitting there knowing he's a Christian. And so it was very interesting to hear some of the little interactions. For instance, a couple of things that, that Christopher Hitchens said about how old humanity is. He said, you know, I'll grant 250,000 years. And he looked at Francis Collins and said, is that okay with you? And he said, I think 100,000. He said, okay, 100,000, I'll take that, you know. So there's a fascinating kind of dynamic, but we are so addicted to the scientific. We also are addicted to the controversial, all right? Why are we so fascinated with reality TV shows? It's like a train wreck, right? You can't look away. Well, some of this controversy with regard to religious beliefs, which have been so much a part of our history, I think are, you know, people are fascinated because it is so controversial. And, and a lot of people, and here's another thing, people in our culture today, our culture being the West, US, Canada, whatever, some of you may feel better about yourself because you may not be from those places, uh, from what I'm about to say, we have lost the ability to think clearly. We simply do not, we no longer understand reason as we should. We don't teach logic anymore. We don't teach the ability to consider you know, a logical progression of thought. Somebody with credentials after their name tells us something outrageous, and we go, dang, that must be true because he's important. Or it sounds good, and so we buy it without thinking about it. This afternoon, we'll have the second lecture in a course called Apologetics II. It's part of our Lakeside Institute of Theology, and it's second level apologetics response to the new atheists. There are very good responses to what these guys are saying, but most people don't bother, okay? Because they're popular, they're bestsellers. It must be right. Is that part of that lazyism I saw you had? Lazyism, exactly. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't know anything, I don't think about anything, where's my beer? Okay. <laughs> So, it began really with uh, the, the publication of The End of Reason, and the subtitle is Religion, Terror, and the End, uh, the End of Faith, and The End of Reason by Sam Harris. Other major books have been The God Delusion in 2006 by Roger Dawkins, probably the most significant and influential. It has sold, it's been translated into over 30 languages, and it has sold millions of copies. And then um, Breaking the Spell in 2006 by Daniel Dennett and God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens in 2007. Let me talk about these four guys. These four are so important in the movement. They have been called the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse. You know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse is a reference to the book of Revelation. They're the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse because they've been so Richard Dawkins is an English ethnologist. 
uh, evolutionary biologist, and as I said, he's known for his gene-centered view of evolution. His book, The Selfish Gene, completely revolutionized the way they understand uh, the evolutionary process. He wrote the book, The God Delusion, the best-selling and probably most influential of all these books. Interestingly, Alistair McGrath, who is a, Alistair, this gives you another example, Alistair McGrath is a Christian theologian and author. He has three doctorates, and the first one he got was in molecular biology from, from Cambridge. Uh, he's been on faculty at uh, Cambridge for, or Oxford, excuse me, for quite a while. So he's got three doctorates. Well, he responds, he's got a book in just, just responding to the God delusion and pointing out how their definitions are all wrong. You know, I, I listen to these guys speak in YouTube uh, videos and whatnot, like Christopher Hitchens. And if you accept his premises, this is where logic comes in, if you accept his premises, then his conclusion is correct. But his premises are all wrong. And yet we don't know how to, how to, interpret that and, and respond to that. Well, people who do know how to do that have written a lot of books in response from a religion. Even, even, and the thing about the new atheists is even the other atheists don't like them. Okay? The lecture I'm going to do today, I'm going to have a lot of quotes from other people who are not theists, they're not believers in any religion. And they think these guys have gone way too far, they, they, they put, set up straw men to knock them down, they don't do a good job of representing what is logical and reasonable. So, Richard Dawkins, I could go into a lot more detail, but uh, you, you don't need that right now. The second one is Christopher Hitchens. As I said, Christopher Hitchens, because he's a journalist, he's widely known as being, by his own acknowledgement, a uh, contrarian, meaning almost anything anybody says, he's going to argue against it. He's very strange. He identifies himself as a socialist and Marxist, but he was a huge supporter of George W. Bush. Because Bush, when 9-11 when happened, uh, Christopher Dawkins felt like the West, particularly he felt the liberal West, because he counts himself as a liberal, not as a conservative. He's been called a neoconservative because of his support for the Iraq War, for, for Bush's approach to the Iraq War. He says, I'm not a conservative of any kind. You know, he said, I'm, I'm as liberal as you can get, but somebody needed to do something about it after 9-11, and he at least did. Now, his, all of his liberal, you know, his liberal friends just sort of scratch their head over that. Um, Christopher Hitchens is a fat, it's a great personality. He's the kind of guy you want to talk to at a party. You know, he's funny, he's bright, you never know what's coming next. He, for instance, has completely excoriated. He has, he has written negative things about Mother Teresa. Okay? And, and Bill Clinton, and, you know, uh, uh, Pope Benedict, and various others. I mean, you never know, you didn't know, uh, you pretty much know now because he's dead. He died of esophageal cancer in 2011. But his most popular book in this vein, he's written, he either wrote or contributed to like 25 different books, including some of them anthologies of essays that he'd written for publication in, uh, in uh, newspapers. He wrote, God is not great, how religion poisons everything. And so he, he as I say, his influence, not as a scientist, but as just a fascinating guy. And he's the, kind of, he's the guy in Great Britain, whenever they wanted somebody to give a really flamboyant response to anything on TV, they call him in. I mean, he's dozens and dozens of documentaries he's been in, of talk shows he's been on, of news broadcasts. He's the expert they'll call in, even though he doesn't have any scientific credentials with regard to that. Um, the, I'll keep going here. Again, I can tell you a lot more about these people. But the other two of the four horsemen of the non-apocalypse are, oh, and one of the things I have to say about Christopher Hitchens, somebody asked him one time in an interview for The Independent in London, this was right after George W. Bush made the comment that we were in a fight against the axis of evil. You remember the axis of evil speech? They asked Christopher Hitchens, well, who do you think is the axis of evil? And Christopher Hitchens said, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And we have to fight them with everything we've got. Um, he was definitely a controversialist and, and a contrarian. Um, oh, one other quote I want to give you from him. He said, organized religion, and this is a quote, is the main source of hatred in the world. It is violent, irrational, intolerant, allied to racism, tribalism, and bigotry, invested in ignorance and hostile to all free, free inquiry, contemptuous of women, coercive toward children, and therefore it ought to have a great deal on its conscience. Now, nobody with any sense would say religion has always gotten it right, or that it has not been responsible for some bad stuff. But all evil, according to Hitchens and some of these other guys, are attributable to religious belief. What was his personal life like? Um, <laughs> I don't know a lot about that. I can't get into it. 
actually, Hitchens and Dawkins both were raised as Christians. They were both uh, they were both in church. Dawkins says he left Christianity when he was when he as a young, very you know, sort of a teenager, was introduced to evolutionary biology. And Dawkins just I think he would say I just got over it. Okay, I, I grew up, but I can't get into too much detail. On that. So these guys, Daniel Dennett, the, the first two were British. These two guys are American. Daniel Dennett is an American philosopher, especially a philosopher of scientists, of science, a cognitive scientist, and evolutionary biologist. Um, he wrote Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomena. These two guys, especially Dennett, but both of them, really do explain everything in human culture as being a product of science and of evolution, including morality. One of the big problems that the new atheists have had, or any atheist, but especially the new atheists, is, is explaining where morality comes from. Historically, it's been understood that morality, this inherent sense we have, is, is itself an argument for the existence of some higher power. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity makes a beautiful argument of this. He says, if we say that a, that a, that a line is, uh, or a rod is bent, what are we comparing it to? If we say that something is wrong, or not true, where do we get this sense that some things are wrong? When, you know, like, example, and I use this example in classes I've taught, a young woman who has two small children dies in a car accident. And the reaction is, that's just wrong. That should not happen. Where in the world do we get this idea that that's wrong? That happens every day. That's so natural. What is it in us that says that some things are wrong and some things are right? Some things are true and some things are false? Without any evidence for that. This existence of an internal sort of guideline, this internal moral guide, has traditionally always been understood to be something about the human nature that is made in the image of God or the divine. And so we have that built in. These guys struggle to try to explain where does that come from if you don't believe in the divine. And so uh, breaking the spell religion as a natural phenomenon gets into that. He also as a scientist, an evolutionary scientist, evolutionary biologist, Darwin's dangerous idea, he also gets there into how does um, evolutionary biology explain all of the things that we we take for granted. This afternoon I'm going to be talking about how it is that their arguments are self-defeating, I believe. Because they say that human reason tells us that you can't put your faith in all that. Well, very smart people have argued, but you're putting all your faith in human reason. You know, you claim that you believe that this is all just a natural phenomena happening because of bio biological evolution. Well, biological evolution, by any definition, is not related to truth. It's just related to survival. And let you claim that your cognitive abilities, which are a product of evolution, give you access to what is really true. You can't make that argument based upon your belief in evolutionary biology. There are no values. There is no truth or untruth based upon what they argue. Okay, I'm getting into, you know, into a sermon right now. Uh, the fourth is Sam Harris. He sort of launched this thing as a doctoral student. He was still a grad student when he wrote The End of Faith. He then, there were so much, many protests about that, he then came back and wrote a book called Letter to a Christian Nation, The Moral Landscape. Um, and the interesting thing about these two guys, Daniel Dennett has had a major focus on two things. One, he is part of a movement called the Bright Movement, B-R-I-G-H-T. And, and so, which is a movement of people who are bright enough not to believe in anything, any divine, okay? If there's a, a society, the Brights, you can go on the internet and look it up. He is a big supporter of that, an advocate of it. Dawkins is involved too, but not as much. And the other thing Dawkins does is he launched a thing called the Clergy Project. The Clergy Project is based on Dennett's belief that there are a lot of Christian ministers, and later they expanded it to other religions, who don't really believe it anymore. But they're still doing it because that's their job and they have to feed their kids. So the Clergy Project, they claim to have several hundred ministers who are atheists who finally decided they don't believe this anymore, but they're still, most of them are still in the pulpit. It's like I recently talked about, there's a, there's a Presbyterian minister in Oregon who is outspoken about the fact he does not believe in God, but then he gets mad when people tell him he's not a Christian. Um, okay, you gotta pick a lane, guy. Um, so, but, so Daniel Dennett's into that. Sam Harris, um, very interestingly, Sam Harris is probably the most aggressive of all of these guys. He, in um, the second book, I think it was, the uh, Letter to a Christian Nation, he said that beliefs are dangerous. They all say that, the Christian belief especially is, is the source of evil. But he, Sam Harris says, beliefs are so dangerous that I think it's justified for some people to be executed for what they believe. 
I think we fought some wars over that kind of thing just not too long ago, right? The idea of a totalitarian decision that if you don't agree with us, we have a right to, to imprison or execute you. Um, and yet, that's why Sam Harris, of all of these guys, is the one that people turn away from more often. There are a bunch of other people that are involved in this new atheist movement. But uh, you'll, you'll hear names like Victor Stanger, Steven Pinker, um, Lawrence Krauss, Jerry Coyne, um, uh, Bag Louis Bagnini, um, various other names will come along. But they, again, if you want to come to the lecture this afternoon, no obligation, no cost. You can come and hear me talk about why. And today, my, the lecture is Faith and Reason. They claim that there is, that it is irrational. There is no reason possible for somebody to believe in God. And so today I'm going to be talking about that. I didn't intend this to be a pitch for the coming of that class, but if you want to, you can. It's 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock. I want to just finish by saying, back to the start of our talk, religion, contrary to the new atheists, um, has always existed. Every human culture we know about has had some kind of religious belief, some belief that the physical world we live in is, is not all there is. There is something more than this. And it's from that that they have taken meaning, and direction and hope for the future and all sorts of things that the new atheists say are, are silliness. Um, again, 70% of the world's people identified themselves as religious. Only 11% identified themselves as convinced atheists or questionable. 92% of Americans believe in a personal God. And I was surprised even recently in doing some research that uh, recent polls over the last five years have said that religious belief worldwide is growing. Fewer people are saying they have no religious belief. More people are committing to the faith. And some people say, well, that's because of the growth of Islam. Well, Islam is the fastest growing religion, but it's not the fastest growing because of conversions. It's the fastest growing because of birth rate. You know, the birth rates in predominantly Muslim countries are much higher. This is one of the reasons that uh, Israel is having so much trouble. They will not give one person one vote to the Muslim Palestinians, because if they did so, they would be outvoted, because there are more of them. So the nation of Israel is a sanctuary for the Jewish people will be gone. Um, the, we talked a lot in the first, you know, first lecture, and it's a, it, it should be available soon online. I'm not sure where we are on that. In 2011, a three-year Oxford University study of 40 different, it actually is a coalition of 40 different studies, drew the conclusion that, quote, religion comes naturally, even instinctively, to human beings. And there is a lot of work now in what's called, in an area called neurotheology, identifying that the human brain appears to be hardwired. There appears to be, in the human brain, neurological um, demands, talk about evolutionary biology, that we have belief, that we have faith, that we practice a religious belief. And this quote from Dr. Roger Trigg at Oxford, who was the one who directed that, com that study, combination study, he concluded by saying, we tend to see purpose in the world. We see agency, meaning somebody doing something. We think that something is there even if you can't see it. All this tends to build up a religious way of thinking. I particularly, in studying all this stuff, I've made my decision. I believe Christianity is the one that makes most sense, and that's where I planted my flag, I think, Unless you decide to decide with a new atheist, which I hope you won't, because I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you need to decide where to plant your flag. Any questions? Yes? I feel a distinction has to be made between religious and life of the spirit. There are, you use constantly the word religion, religion okay. which is like an organized set of ideas, and I
those spiritual motivations have ended up manifesting themselves in some sort of re religion. And the, the term religion um, means a belief in supernatural beings. It doesn't necessarily have to mean something, an organized religion, per se. Um, and so I, I understand that. I don't think, um, I can't agree, because my background is philosophy, I can't agree with the idea that all religions point to the same thing. Because, well, exactly, point to the same thing. Point to the same thing. Because religions contradict each other. And again, I mentioned that earlier on, I suggested it earlier today. The three basic laws of thought in philosophy, which have always been accepted as the foundation of all rational thought, are the law of identity, something is what it is. The third one is the law of the excluded middle, it either is or it isn't, it can't, there's, there's not something in between. And the second one, the, the important one here, is the law of non-contradiction. Something cannot both be and not be at the same time and in the same way. Um, those, those three are called the laws of thought, that you can't have reason, reasonable thought, rational thought without them. Well, the law of non-contradiction, if I say that I believe Jesus was the divine Son of God, and a Muslim or Jew says he's not, we both have a right to say that, and I would defend the right of everyone to have those beliefs, as long as they don't hurt somebody else. But if I say he was the Son of God, and a Muslim or Jew says he wasn't, Having the right to say that does not mean we're both right, because logic, rationality, the basis of all rational thought says we can't both be right. So while, you know, I, in almost every instance in human history, when people have religious or spiritual motivations, it ends up taking some form, okay, and, and that form is where religions came from. Um, whether that be revelational, as in the case of the monotheisms, or whether that be sort of trying to explain the, you know, the, the world. It is very common today, and I, please, I hope I don't offend you in saying this, it's very common today to say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. That's a complete cop-out, I think. The people who come to my church have heard me say, to say I'm spiritual, but not religious, to me, sounds like you're saying, I want all the benefits, but none of the responsibilities. I have a diabetic. Good, and that's one. Then that's 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 great. For you, that must take some form. Again, in ritual, we talk about religions having ritual. The idea of how do you experience that? How do you practice that? How do you? Are there places you go? Are there things you do? That's where a lot of those things start, and then they become more formalized. And that's not a negative, but that, that's really the only difference is at what stage of formalizing of those kinds of functions, whether you define it as a religion or a spiritual experience. But I think, again, looking historically, um, first philosophically and then historically, there, it's always been the case that human beings have needed some way to, to structure their, the major experiences in their life. We all brush our teeth in the same way. Okay? We, all have, we all have certain roots that we always take. We are ritual, human beings are ritualistic animals. All religion is, is that the belief systems, wherever the source of them were, at, at some point, those became ritual, they became repeated, and, and religions developed. Now again, the revelatory religions, the monotheistic religions, believe that God gave us instructions about that, and so we're being obedient to that. But whatever it is, religion is not a bad word. All it means is a formalized ritual approach to our spiritual experiences, you know, wherever you fall in that. So I hope I didn't sound like I was being negative when I used that word. Yeah. Decide to plant your flag, part of our responsibility. I had a friend once 
who was a, he actually was one of my teachers in college, and he was a, he was a Christian, and I was a young Christian, and he said, and he was a brilliant guy, very kind of cynical. And he said, you know, I'm fed up with the Christian church. I don't need it. I don't, I don't like those people. I am not going to go back there. I don't have anything to do with it. And I looked at him and said, and what I, I think was maybe divinely inspired, I said, well, that's an awfully selfish attitude. You say you don't need them. Well, maybe they need you. Okay, so we have to be careful what our focus is. Because anytime the focus is on us, whether it's that we get more money or we get more prestige or we get whatever it is, then we probably are headed down the wrong road. So well, what comes to mind here, because this is such a Catholic country, and I'm sort of involved in the Catholic community because I'm married to a Mexican, is the way that some people who are poor here, and they have a party, they will apologize up front for saying that it's going to be a small party. Right. It's like, well, it's a party, so, but that's, I mean, it's like, it's not a big party, yeah. and it's just a party. Exactly. What do people expect? You know, and there are, we've had a couple of people who left our church because we're building this building. And they thought you should use the money for something else. Well, we will finish this building with no debt, and our cash flow will be better because we won't be paying rent somewhere else. And the reason we're building this building, and you hear that we're then over there, is because this will be the platform for us to not only expand our, our religious, our, you know, our, our spiritual kind of uh, work, but we are already launching a feeding program. Um, and we will be providing dry dispenser food distribution. We will have a commercial kitchen, besides the kitchen we have out here, a commercial kitchen where we will do a hot food program. We already are distributing clothing. Um, we will, we're looking at having a daycare for mothers. You know, most Mexican mothers have somebody else who can care for kids, but if they don't, they need to work. We're providing work clothes already and shoes, new shoes and boots for, for people. Who, now, I'm saying all that not to say aren't we a great church, but that's what we should be doing. And, and the reason why we're building this building is not only so we have more room for people to come and do this kind of thing, as well as worship uh, and have classes, but we had no room in our old building to store clothes, to hand out, or to prepare food at any scale or anything else. And this building will give us the ability to do that. So sometimes we have to look at it and say there may be other issues behind that, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you will never see gold implements here. In fact, we were teasing about that the other day, that our, when we had communion, our communion trays that the cups sit in weren't fitting right. They're sort of warped. And I said, you know, if we got gold ones, they wouldn't warp. <laughs> and I was kidding, because these are racks, okay? Um, because we're not going to go there. But then at the same time, I'm not going to, you know, it's not my job to be condemning of them. I don't agree with that, and we won't do that here. But, you know, my... Right. Well, and religion, as I say, is the organized part. It's, it's in, in, in many cases, it started out informally, and then you, as, as creatures who are given a ritual, we begin to do the same things, and that becomes the form. Uh, the content is what we believe. The form is what we do to express our belief. Now, when you, it's possible for the, for the form to take over, for to, to be too religious in the sense that you've got all the form and you don't have any of the content anymore. In other words, you don't, why are we doing this? One of the other classes that we're having on Thursdays is worship. And yesterday, we spent the whole time asking questions and talking about what is true worship? And what does it mean to, to have false worship? What does it mean to have a false church? We really struggle with those things. We want to make sure that we are not just having the form, the religious form, without having the spiritual content. It, it, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with an appropriate spiritual form. In fact, we said, if the form reflects our beliefs, if the form accurately reflects our content, then that's the right balance. But when the form takes over, and that, that, that's, I think, the religious spirit, that's when we're focusing on the religious part, we don't have the spiritual part, then we have a problem. Okay, I'm preaching again. Um, thank you all very much. And again, uh, if you have any suggestions for the next series of talks that you would like to hear, some of the ones I mentioned, or anything else, I'm very open to hearing that. Because I was asked, if anybody wanted to make a gift to support the completion of our church, plan on coming back on November 22nd for the grand opening of our church. It'll be in the newspaper, trust me. But if you'd like to make a gift, there is a basket back there, and I'm always open to answer questions or help in any other way. Thank you very much for coming to these.